You're watching Pulse for the 24th or 25th of October and it's time for the BlizzCon Day 2 Recap. While most of the big announcements did come on the first day of BlizzCon, there's still quite a lot of interesting stuff to look at here. So if you're only keen for the tournament results, you can click on the annotation on your screens right now to take you there. If you want the StarCraft news and nothing else, click it to watch it, or just watch it all and enjoy. I won't even try to tell you what you'll find in these parts as there was just a ton of information, so... Without waiting any longer, let's get started. Now as you can see from the Saturday schedule, we had quite a lot happening, but the amount of information that we actually gleamed from all of this was a little bit less than we got on the first day. As I mentioned in the introduction, all the big announcements did come on day one. We did still get a few snippets of useful information and learnt a few things we didn't know before. But I will be starting the news off with the BlizzCon Day 2 tournament results. As you know, the tournaments were concluded on Day 2 and I gotta say, the StarCraft that I watched was pretty epic indeed. Speaking of the StarCraft, the finals were in fact between IM MVP and IM's Nest Yes, these guys faced off against each other in the winner's bracket finals and Nesty took MVP out with ease with a score of 2-0. That forced MVP to paddle his way through another Zerg player, Sen, but that didn't seem to be too much trouble for him at all. That means MVP was back to face off against Nesty again and in the first series these guys played, MVP took Nesty down with a score of 2-0. In the second series things were a bit closer. MVP won the first game, Nesty took the second, and that meant it came down to a clutch match for both of them. I honestly couldn't believe that the last game actually went on for over 40 minutes between these two guys. We saw everything in the game, from Infestors, to Broodlords, to Ghosts and Nukes. It was crazy. In the end though, MVP's constant harass and the snipes from those Ghosts were just too much for Nesty to handle. MVP took that, and that means if you had to tally up the score, MVP would have won the grand finals with a score of 4-3. to three. Very very impressive stuff and he walked away with $50,000 to show for it. You can obviously find those full results below, check the brackets out to see the path that both Nesty and MVP took to get to the grand finals and much more. On the World of Warcraft side of things, Team OMG from Korea managed to dominate the rest for pretty much the entire weekend. They earned themselves $75,000 by taking skill capped down in the finals. Also pretty impressive stuff, and if you still have that virtual ticket you can catch those VODs on the BlizzCon website right now if you missed them. Now let's move on to the World of Warcraft news. On the second day we had the World of Warcraft classes, items and professions Q&A, the open Q&A, the lore and story Q&A, and lastly the World of Warcraft art panel. Now the way I'm going to do this is, I'm just going to summarize some of the interesting points that I learned while watching all of these. I'm not going to cover every single question that was asked because some of them were a little bit silly. Now, a few things we learned. Blizzard is apparently working on new character models for the older races, but there's no ETA on them yet. It seems like enchanters will go back to making wands as well, and don't forget that wands are now primary weapons for casters. Yes, that silly ranged slot is in fact gone. Blizzard are planning remakes for both Scholomance and Scarlet Monastery, and yes, we'll be receiving heroic versions of these as well, for level 90s. It seems like the guild transfer and guild name changing service is gonna go live in about two weeks, so that's a pretty big thing for people playing right now. And in the art panels, we gotta look at all the work that went into creating the Pandaren, the new zones we're gonna be exploring, and all the new dungeons in said zones. It seems like Blizzard have a graphic novel planned featuring the Pandaren, and that might well come out before the game does, so that's pretty cool. It seems like Theramor is set to be destroyed by the Horde in the pre-Mists of Pandaria world events. That's coming in patch 5.0. This information was actually not revealed at BlizzCon, but it's definitely still relevant. In the future, you might be able to use Valor Points to increase the item level of your items slightly. Blizzard apparently have big plans to move the resource bars of other classes down to the center of your screen as well, much like they do with the Monk right now. That's pretty interesting and it seems like they're going to be targeting Paladins and Death Knights with those changes first. And one of the biggest things that was mentioned on the second day was that if the game was on the decline and the subscriptions weren't enough to support the game, Blizzard would consider making World of Warcraft a freemium game. I suppose a lot of people knew that already anyway. 
Now along with all of these mentions there are a couple of extras to have a look at. Firstly you can see what it'll look like when you choose your destiny as a Pandaren. When you need to choose either Horde or Alliance after the starting zone this is the screen you'll be greeted with. Well maybe not this screen exactly. As you can see Blizzard were a little tongue in cheek with the descriptions of the Horde and Alliance here. Definitely worth checking out in full size below. You can have a look at a couple of short gameplay videos of the Pandaren starting zone. Yes, someone actually recorded this off screen and they risked their lives doing so, so be happy for it. You can have a look at what the guys over at the Yogscast think about the Mists of Pandaria. They have a first look and announcement video up. Then along with all of this, the guys over at Wowhead already have talent calculators up for the Mists of Pandaria talent trees. That's pretty crazy and I can't believe they've got them out already. You can have a look at all the monk abilities that have been previewed and you can see them all in action in a video. Then you can have a look at a couple of websites that have a couple of exclusive interviews up with the World of Warcraft devs and much more. Yes, the links are packed full of information and I gotta say, that's pretty much what Day 2 was all about. Lots of smaller snippets of information, we didn't have any big announcements like on the first day. That's fine by me though, even more news to explore and you can do so below. Now let's have a look at what happened with Diablo 3 on Day 2. Day 2's Diablo panels included the open Q&A, the lore panel and the making of the Black Soulstone cinematic. Starting with the open Q&A, you can read a little bit more about what I mentioned yesterday. Followers will be more powerful endgame now. Blizzard are planning on making them viable all the way through Inferno difficulty. So that's really, really cool. Then you can read Blizzard's response to the question, is Diablo a girl? They pretty much sidestepped it, but they did say that Diablo doesn't confine to our human gender stereotypes. They told us that it's no secret that they are hiring for a console version of the game, but there's nothing confirmed just yet. They also said that WASD controls will not be available. It just doesn't seem to work very well with the game. They told us that there will be more beta key waves going out after BlizzCon. We'll never see more than just the six skill slots that we have right now. They told us that guild support in Diablo 3 is not something they're thinking of doing anytime soon. And lastly, they had a bit of a talk about what will happen if you already have Diablo 3 on your account from the annual World of Warcraft subscription and you want to add the collector's edition to that. It seems like they will credit you with four months of World of Warcraft game time if you do add that collector's edition. Now I just mentioned the more interesting questions and there were a lot more to have a look at. But next up, let's see what was said in the lore panel. In this, Chris Metzen and the Diablo team went back to basics and spoke about the very beginning of the Diablo lore. They spoke about the angels, Tyriel the angel of justice, Oriel the angel of hope, Imperius the angel of valor and Ethereal the angel of fate. And I'll tell you now that they didn't just talk about these, they went pretty in depth. They also covered the primevals and focused a lot on Asmodan, the Lord of Sin. As you probably know, it did seem in that Black Soulstone cinematic. And I'm assuming he's going to play a pretty big part in Diablo 3's story. My favorite part of the lore panel was actually the areas that they covered. Three new areas were shown from Act 2 and all three of these areas are in fact playable and they play an important role in telling the story as we progress through the act. They showed us Chaldeum, the Jewel of the East. Dolgar Oasis and the Archives of Zoltan Kul. I don't know about you guys, but Keldium is the one area that I absolutely can't wait to visit. For some reason I just really like the idea of it and I think it's going to look absolutely stunning in game. There were a couple of questions and answers in this panel as well and they were also pretty interesting. Apparently Adria is in fact dead and you'll find out how she died in Diablo 3. Apparently Ormus was removed from Diablo 3 but they're looking for a way to get him back. We're not going to be seeing any areas from Diablo 2 apart from Tristram. And lastly, it seems like there might well be sightings of the Diablo 2 heroes in Diablo 3. The Necromancer's Apprentice will apparently be in Act 2. That's the only one that was mentioned. There were more questions than just that and you can find them in the links below. But right now, we're going to have a look at the making of the Black Soulstone cinematic. This was actually a lot more interesting than I thought it would be and the guys presenting the panel did an amazing job. They told us how important storytelling is in cinematics, how difficult it is to choose the absolute perfect colors for every single scene, the many different effects they use and how they set them up, the tons of references they use from real life. 
Then they had a long talk about how difficult it was to get Leah to look as good as she does, and much more. It really is crazy how long it takes to make these cinematics and how many people are involved. We also learnt in this panel that there are about 27 minutes of cinematics in Diablo 3. And this took quite a few years for the Diablo 3 development team to set up. So all those people out there saying Blizzard should definitely start making movies. Well, you should really watch this panel, then you'll be able to see how difficult that could actually be. While that pretty much does it for the panels, there are a bunch of extras to have a look at. You can see a couple of interviews with Jay Wilson, David Adams, Kevin Martins, Leonard Boyarski and more. You can find some ninja gameplay footage below and you can find transcriptions of all those panels. Check it out and enjoy. Now we're going to move along to the StarCraft 2 news. On day 2 we had the StarCraft 2 Blizzard Dota and Mod Tools panel and the StarCraft Heart of the Swarm Art and Technology panel. I will tell you now that there are a lot of overlaps between these two so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cover them both together. First up Blizzard spoke about the Arcade and this is actually the replacement or the new name for the map marketplace. The Arcade is going to serve as a hub for both free and premium games created by the community for the community. They tell us that the commerce elements of this will come later on, but they are definitely coming, so don't worry about that. Then they said that their goals with the arcade, or at least with the first version of it, would just be to allow players to easily locate games, to play the games they want to play, and they just want to prepare Battle.net as a place for actually selling games. I suppose the concepts they showed look pretty cool, and I gotta say it does look like it's gonna make things a lot easier. So if you're interested in this new arcade, you can read more about it below. Then they just went into a bit of detail about the art tools they used. They showed some of the flexibility of the system off with these tomorrowlings. Yes, they actually looked like they belong. They had a pretty extensive talk about Blizzard Dota as well, and they told us how they want the game to be easy to learn and difficult to master. They said they're going to change the landscape of learning by simplifying stats into damage, health and mastery, concentrating item choices into simplified categories, stat boosts, consumables, items and artifacts. They're going to make intuitive abilities that are quick to understand without complex math. And if you're wondering, the heroes will have roles in Blizzard Dota. Tank, Support, DPS and Siege. So yes, there was a lot more said about Blizzard Dota. Things like they want shorter, more intense games. They want a hardcore team concept. You actually have to play along with your friends. You can't just solo everything and everyone. And they want to reward unselfish play. So now a few extras. You can actually mount up in the game. The towers in the game work a lot differently than those in games such as League of Legends or Heroes of New Earth. They actually have to regenerate their ammo over time and I think it's a really really cool mechanic. So if they shoot too much in a short period of time they'll go inactive for a little while. That means that hanging back and trying to deny creeps and get lost hits can actually end up being detrimental if you don't handle it well. There are mercenary camps in the game, there are special regen globes that drop from specific creeps, and if you pick these up they act pretty similarly to those in Diablo 3 where they'll give you a bit of health and mana back, and I really like that idea. That means that the fighting can be a little bit more fast paced and frantic, and you've actually got a bit of a goal or I suppose something to look out for when you kill in mobs. So I personally am pretty keen for Blizzard Dota. As I said in my day one recap, it looks like they're not going to try and make this anything too serious, and they're definitely not going to be trying to compete with Heroes of New Earth, League of Legends or Dota 2. Other pretty interesting things that the Blizzard guys showed off were things like this. How much did you have to drink tonight, sir? I don't like this. I didn't sign up for this. Yes, and if that wasn't enough, have a look at this mock-up of the Heart of the Swarm ending. And no, this doesn't really contain any spoilers. Feel free to watch it.
I don't even know what they were thinking. But anyway, moving along. The biggest highlight for me from the Heart of the Swarm Art and Technology section was the StarCraft 2 engine development history. As a lot of you know, StarCraft 2 and StarCraft 1 for that matter didn't look the same when they started working on it as it did when they actually launched it. And the Blizzard guys had a nice video up showing how much change actually occurred over the development of the game. It's absolutely crazy how it looked a couple of years ago compared to how it looked when it actually shipped. You should definitely check this video out, and thanks to some people, it's actually available right here on YouTube now. The Blizzard guys also mentioned a couple of engine improvements they have planned for Heart of the Swarm. One that definitely stood out was the fact that creep can now start slowly covering buildings. It's quite disgusting, but incredibly satisfying. It sounds like they want to make the game look and run better on low graphics as well, which I suppose is a good thing. Now that pretty much covers it, but there are one or two extras to mention and there's a lot more to see in the links below, so you better check that out. But, in one big thing that I should have probably mentioned all the way at the start, it seems like low ground pylons no longer give power on the high ground in Heart of the Swarm. I think this might actually be a bug and I very much doubt Blizzard would go through with a change like this and not even mention it to us. But if you're interested, you can read more about that below. So if you were wondering about the ending ceremony, it's not really news, but I can talk about it. There was a performance by the artist now known as the artist formerly known as Level 90 Elite Torrent Chieftain. Yes, that's a bit of a mouthful, but their performance was pretty great. Then we were blessed with Foo Fighters. And, well, there's nothing to say about that. What can I say? Foo Fighters are such an amazingly good live act that it's actually a bit ridiculous. They ended their performance off with their most popular song ever long and everyone definitely went home happy. As I mentioned before though, you can find everything that I spoke about in the links below. So thanks for watching, check back here soon for more news. If you did in fact miss the day one recap, have a look at that as well because there's a lot more interesting stuff in that one. And most importantly, happy BlizzCon day two.